Hi everyone, this is Sam Black with Drafting Archetypes, and today I am going to be discussing uh, Green Black in Wilds of Eldraine. So, for those who have been following along with the podcast so far in this format, I've been, and also in previous formats, I've been taking a little bit of a different approach this format, where I've been focusing less on like two color pairs and more on other things that I think are like relevantly archetype defining due to the fact that like this format allows a lot of splashing and I don't know, a few other things. But this is going to be more of a traditional two color pair analysis. So looking at how green black stacks up on 17 lands to other two color pairs, green black is the best performing archetype. It is drafted a little bit less than red white and more appreciably less than red black. Those are the two pairs that are drafted more than it. It's the third most drafted pair. And I'm looking at green black, um, not just because it's the winningest two color pair, but because I think that it's like a pretty coherent archetype that has a fairly reliable set of synergies that lead to a consistent game plan. Like green black really feels like, you know, it's an archetype in this uh, format. I think that it is largely a controlling deck in that it expects to have more power going long than most of its opponents and it can use food to like get out of range um, of aggro decks in long games, uh, thanks to the life gain. And then also because it's like making food and it's like pretty good at getting some other objects sometimes, um, well, really it has Hopeless Nightmare, right? And, and some rolls, it has a decent number of rolls. Those things all make it uh, pretty good at using bargain cards. We see that in the numbers with uh, Hamlet Glutton being the winningest green card in green black um, because you're just very good at being able to cast it for five mana. And, you know, when your plan is to kind of like stabilize and turn the corner with big creatures, it does exactly that. And then, you know, any other bargain cards you have that aren't that great, uh, you can you can support those pretty well. It's a late game green deck, therefore it can splash. With that said, I think it splashes a little bit less aggressively than you might expect most late game green decks to splash, especially in a format where the fixing is so good. Partially, I think that like the fixing is a little bit more contested in this format because decks don't have to be base green in order to splash. So you're more likely to use your grottos and prisms and stuff like that in non-green decks. So the green the green black deck might not like get a ton of free fixing late. Also, and kind of more importantly, I think that your synergies are pretty self-contained in green black. Uh, there aren't a lot of like cards that you'll need in other colors um, to make your to make your deck work. So you can get by just green black pretty easily. Uh, the, the deck does want some card advantage since, you know, you want to play a lot of one-for-ones and you're trying to hit your land drops and be able to play expensive spells and you don't want to just lose to, like, removal on your first big guy where you're like, I invested all this stuff, it gets answered, now am I too far behind? Having some card draw so that you can play another big guy after that can be helpful. The best... Way to splash to fix that problem, of course, is to play hatching plans because you're a deck that bargains well, so you can prioritize ways to, to sacrifice it, and it's an easy splash and a large amount of card advantage. But you can also get a similar effect in color with like Up the Beanstalk or just two for one adventures, Erit's Whisper, the uh, mind drop that makes a, the four mana opponent discards to make a wicked roll, sorcery. So you don't, like I, like I was saying, you can, you can get all the stuff that you need just in color. Right before this podcast, I drafted and I'm playing a straight green black deck that has Season of Growth and two Tangle Span Lookouts, really harkening back to the Enchantress episode that I did about those. But you can get some of those synergies in your green black deck to get some other like sources of card advantage, get your card flow going without needing any other colors. So Shatter the Oath uh, stands out to me as an overperformer in this archetype, especially on 17 lands. You would expect that the like cards that make food would do well in the food archetype. But despite that, Minstrosity and Sweet Tooth Witch 
both of which do well in this archetype, are better in aggregate in black decks uh, per 17 land stats than Shatter the Oath, but it actually switches in green-black to Shatter the Oath performing better than Minstrosity and Sweet Tooth Witch in green-black. So uh, to me that says that Shatter the Oath is playing really well in green-black, and I, seeing that, have been prioritizing it a little more highly today and having some good experiences where it's not that hard to end up in a situation where your opponent and you and your opponent are both playing green and you both have like big things and shatter the oath is exactly what you need to kill theirs and attack with yours it's a lot of mana but it works and the role can be very good just giving you a better attack but also working with the bargain stuff and also meaning that you get to draw cards off of your lookouts and season of growth and stuff like that so red green can be very aggressive Red black can be very aggressive. So both black and green have like half of an aggressive deck. But I feel like you don't want to take the aggressive green cards from red green and the aggressive black cards from red black and try to put them together. I think that your deck is just going to be a lot worse if you prioritize like straight aggro than if you just do what green black naturally wants to do i think that red is doing a lot of heavy lifting in both of those aggro decks and the green and black cards can play like a decent support game to the red aggressive deck but i don't think that there's like something there where you just try try to make that like aggro thing happen i think you pretty consistently want to expect your deck to be following the normal script for green black where you care about, you know, making incidental objects, getting a little bit of card advantage, having your uh, efficient removal where you can find it, and then like playing big things and overwhelming your opponent in the late game with your larger creatures. I think that like the deck is like, I want to say pretty like simple and straightforward and consistent in what it's doing, but that's not exactly true because of, as I've discussed, some of the like internal clusters that you like can include or not like what i was saying about the enchantress type stuff can be slotted into this deck um you can have like larger or smaller bargain packages splashing and not splashing but within all of those things i think that you still want to be generally expecting that like in an average draw your deck is going to be trying to stay alive until you know turn five or six and then start turning the corner there will be times in green black where you get these like really really good curve aggressive draws where like on turn one you adventure a hollow scavenger the three two that adventures to make a food and then you can sack a food to pump it you can adventure that on turn one make a food turn two welcome to sweet tooth turn three play the scavenger or play some other thing and uh then you have like a good aggressive draw coming. Um, you can also uh, get good aggressive draws with like Tough Cookie and Greta. So like every now and then you'll run your opponent over. Most often an uncommon will be involved in doing that. And so like you can't really plan to have enough of these like premium uncommons to reliably have like draws where you're the aggressor. But it's, you know, certainly a good thing for these decks that like every now and then you get some kind of like free wins where you draw your uncommons and you just kind of curve out and like attack your opponent and uh then your deck also has good late game and so they never really just like there some games where your draw is good and your opponent's just never going to be in the game and having the potential to do that kind of thing it's uh, a big deal it's going to significantly increase your win rate but you still want to draft your deck to be ready for the games where it doesn't go that way, or you draw your Welcome to Sweet Tooth, but your opponent has efficient removal for the, like, 1-1, one, one, and then you end up not getting to land the counters on something or whatever. Looking a little bit deeper into the performance stats for each of the commons, I noticed that there are, like, a lot more black cards that you want in a typical green-black deck than there are green cards. Um, the number of green cards you're looking to play is actually pretty small at common. You're looking for Hamlet Glutton, the 6-6 six, six bargain creature, uh, Hollow Scavenger, the uh, adventurer 3-2 that makes a food, 
they're the best by a lot. And then you also have like Brave the Wilds, the Lay of the Land, Search for a Land that you can bargain to animate a land into a 3-3. Three, three. Ferocious Werefox, the 4-3 uh, trample with the adventurer to give a monstrous roll. Curse the Werefox, the sorcery that gives a monster roll and fights. Root Rider Fawn, the 1-3 that taps for green or fi- uh, filters mana. And then you can like kind of play Red Tooth Genealogist, but it's not very exciting. There, there are a number of other. Red Tooth Genealogist is the 2-3 that makes a noble roll on something. And then there are like some other like okay green cards. Like if you have to play Leaping Ambush, it's no big deal. But like for the most part, you're not really looking to play the other stuff. And then there are just like twice as many black cards that are good. Um, all the removal spells, all the discard, uh, Sweet Tooth Witch, Minstrosity, Screen Puff, and then like even Conceited Witch and Baronati are better than the other green creatures. So that means that you should kind of expect that your green black decks are generally going to be more black than green. It's not exactly that clean because, you know, if black is a stronger color, then there are more people taking black cards in general. The black cards are more contested. You might happen to see more green in a seat than you see black in a seat, even if there are more black cards theoretically in the packs. You know, it's good to know that the card pool is going to skew black heavy, which if you're relying on green fixing can lead to like a little bit of awkwardness in your mana base. But most of the time, I don't think it's going to be a big deal, to be honest. Another card that has like decent stats that I think is worth paying attention to in green black specifically is not dead after all. That's the black instant that creature dies. The next time the creature would die this turn, you uh, return it with a wicked roll. And I've had trouble like figuring out when I want to play that, but it plays pretty well in green black because you have a lot of creatures that trade off pretty frequently and have good enter and or leave the battlefield ability well enter or leave the battlefield abilities like if you use it on any of tough cookie sweet tooth witch greta gingerbread hunter uh hamlet goliath uh minstrosity you're gonna get a food or three life in addition to getting your thing back so that that's kind of a lot of ways to like have this be well i didn't just save my creature and made it bigger but i also got an extra object over like another card that would have saved it so it can kind of perform in a way better than like royal treatment would have not that it's a better card than royal treatment but you're at least getting some value there that's most of what i had to say like overall i think the archetype is pretty simple like you can you know like i talked about you have your like aggressive draws but most of the time you're just kind of looking to trade and then like start casting your gingerbread hunters and screen puffs and hamlet gluttons and win the game uh by just kind of like going over the top of what your opponent's doing very like basic limited magic kind of trying to play like what i think of as like a typical sealed deck game uh more than a draft game where you're like i just want independent like i want each of my cards to be worth a lot on its own so that when we like trade down, I have like a bigger thing left than you do. And then that bigger thing wins the game. Whereas like I think of sealed as a little bit more aggressive. or I mean, draft in general compared to sealed, a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more synergy focused. Uh, in green black, you have some synergies, but because you're like a small game deck where you're like trading off resources and getting up by small amounts or just getting up by no card number advantage, just card size advantage. It has more of a, like, I don't know, classic sealed deck feel to me. If that means something to you, great. If not, don't worry about it. So, going to turn it over to chat for questions. I uh, want to thank the newest patrons, Wesley and Gabe. Thank you so much for the support. For anyone else who's interested in joining the Drafting Archetypes Patreon, supporting uh, me and the podcast and getting, you know, whatever perks are over there be sure to check out patreon.com slash drafting archetypes chat what do you have for me this is a pretty interesting topic so green black is only the best performing 17 lands archetype when you actually look at only two color decks uh it gets more complicated when you look at splashes i mentioned earlier that uh decks with splashes perform better than two color decks in this format which isn't typically true and so it gets kind of like muddier. So then the question is, how do you interpret the 17 lands uh, color data when fixing is so plentiful? And the answer is, it's weird. Uh, I mean, that's the reason that I've been mostly not leaning on the 17 lands color performance data or two color archetypes 
I think that, you know, the, the takeaway here from green black having the best win rate of the two color pairs isn't green black is the strongest archetype and isn't you should be drafting straight green black and isn't you know in general you should be lo looking at or comparing two color decks i think the purpose of noting uh like green black success relative to other two color pairs is just to say hey this is a pretty strong archetype not you know necessarily the best but just like hey the, the thing that's happening here is good as to like the details of how it varies with splashes compared to how other decks vary with splashes i talked a little bit about how like i don't think that splashing is like very necessary i guess is the word for it for green black like you can do it but it's kind of whatever so that could contribute to it potentially like not splashing as well as other decks but i i think that you know the general hey this seems pretty complicated is basically where i land like yeah it is pretty complicated and i'm not sure how much it's worth trying to like delve deep on the stats of exact color performance as a function of like splashing different colors in various color pairs and stuff like that so much of that's just going to come down to like oh well if you're like this color pair and you splash this color pair or this extra color there's a good chance that it's because you have this busted card right like if you're red black and you splash white a lot of the time it's because you have Imidane's Recruiter and then your red black deck with Imidane's Recruiter is going to do better than your red black decks that don't have it. And so the stats in your red black splash white deck is going to be weirdly high, even though like red black doesn't really want to splash um, as, as just a hypothetical example. I don't, I don't know if the numbers support that or anything, but just to say that there, there's, there are a lot of potential factors and I don't think it's like super valuable to like try to unpack all of them from the numbers. I tend to do a lot worse in green black when I draft generically good cards versus being more synergy focused. Do you feel synergy is more important in this archetype than most? I don't know which kinds of synergies you've been like having success with or not personally. Like I talked about the kind of like clusters of things that can be good, like having the, you know, some like role synergies, role slash aura synergies, or having like more food synergies. I mean, I think that in general, you're going to do better when you have more food synergies because I think that like the food cards are pretty good. Then if you don't have that and you have like roll synergies or you have like off the beanstalk synergies or you have bargain synergies, like all of that stuff, like each of those things are good. And if you don't have any of that, then I would be a little bit worried about what you do have. So like in that way, I think that like synergies are important but that's just about like if the sum of your parts is greater than the parts individually it's going to be better just categorically as far as how like that fact compares in green black to other things i think because green black is a like small game attrition deck that has independently strong cards like the sealed deck phenomenon that i was talking about would lead me to believe that in general like synergy is going to be less important than like individual card quality but like given that a lot of the best individual cards also happen to be high synergy cards like welcome to sweet tooth and greta it's a little bit hard to like disentangle those things yeah mostly i think that what's happening is when you don't have synergies you also have like lower overall card quality so it seems to me like this deck wouldn't be accurately conceived of as a cl as classic control but would uh which um but would still fall in the reactive uh small game ends of the spectrum uh thoughts on that and how to best finesse the line between potential beatdown and lo uh, long game prospects yeah i mean so this isn't control the way that like you know a lot of blue decks are controlled this is certainly the like big creature control the way that like you know it, it's in the like green black dinosaurs space right where you're like trying to not die early and then turn the corner hard and have bigger like stuff than your opponent and then, like, how you talk about that in terms of, like, whether you think of that as, like, control or mid-range is kind of whatever. To me, the point is just, like, on average, I think that, you know, you're going to benefit more from, like, the game going. Uh, like, you're going to start doing your good stuff on turn five. So, like, if the game's ending on turn, like, seven to nine, you're probably happier than you are if the game's ending on turn, like, six or, like, five to seven. 
And so in that way, I think that like, you know, you generally like don't want to be, you'd rather not trade damage early and stuff and you would rather trade cards early, but it's certainly, you know, it's not hard control. It's like big proactive, but where the reactive element is more important than the proactive element. Like it's more important to like not take damage early. Like it's not big proactive the way that like red green usually is where you're like, okay, I hope I don't fall too far behind early, but I'm just going to start attacking immediately. This is more like I need to like stabilize, get the ground locked up, and then I can start attacking. Uh, you may have touched on this, but how does Knight of the Sweet's Revenge fit in here? Knight of the Sweet's Revenge is a card that I believe in the potential of, but really needs you to be deep on food. You know, if you have like two or more food when you play it, it costs very little mana the turn that you play it and then makes you a whole bunch of extra mana starting on the next turn. And it's also threatening to end the game really well with its ability because then its ability is making all of your creatures a lot bigger and it's giving you the mana to use its ability pretty cheaply. But if you only have like zero to one other foods when you cast it, then it's just a really bad card. So I think that it is not necessarily easy to expect like if you take knight of the sweets revenge very early some portion of the time you just won't see enough food makers for it to come together and you won't be able to play it even if you're trying to draft for it but uh if you are already in a place with some food or if it's relatively low opportunity cost like if there's just nothing else good in the pack then you can take it early and it is high upside like if you have a bunch of other ways to make food. I don't I don't know the number seven would be a place where I'd be pretty happy with it, but that doesn't mean don't play it on five or six ever. It's it's you know it, it's both murky and not something I have a ton of experience with because I think that the opportunities that you have uh to be in a deck that it works well are relatively rare. But if you do have a bunch of other ways to make food, I think it's uh very strong, especially if you have good ways to take advantage of the extra mana that it generates you. Fellow Horseman has pretty bad stats, but seems like a fine creature. Why do you think it performs so badly? I think it's pretty bad. It's an adventure that costs less than the body, but it's rare that you have a thing to get back before you want to play the body. So, like, the two-mana adventure doesn't slot in well naturally, and if you want to use the adventure, you're not playing your four-drop on turn four, and the four-drop is, like, significantly understated, and because the format in general is good at giving you stuff to spend your mana on, like spending two mana to get an extra creature in your hand, but you had to like sequence your cards kind of weirdly and play like a bad rate card to like make it happen, it just like isn't very like it, there are better ways to like go up a card than that. And there are a lot of them. The the three three is just like pretty underwhelming by the time you can cast it and there are a lot of matchups where your creatures just like aren't going to go to the graveyard that much um maybe they're getting cooped up maybe they're getting stop gapped maybe they're getting torched uh maybe they're just not trading and yeah so I i've generally been pretty disappointed when i've put fell horseman into deck how do you decide between agatha's champion and gluttons when they're in the same pack i'm never sure i'm making the right choice I am also not sure that I'm making the right choice. I've been leaning toward champion, but I might be totally wrong in doing that. That's that's basically my answer. I am more excited when I see a champion, but I I haven't like actually even compared the numbers on those cards, and maybe Glutton's just much better, and I'm very stupid. Does Rat Outfit in this deck? Yes. Uh, you're looking for efficient exchanges uh, that help you play your control game, and you like bargain well. It's generally like not very hard to find a spot where rat out's going to do something useful. The rat itself is going to be like pretty medium for you, but it is uh, still an object for your bargain stuff or a place to put a roll or something. I don't think rat out's like a high priority for the deck, but it's uh, like a, you know, very much a solid playable. Does Fell Horseman's value go up if you have Hamlet Glutton or Gruff Triplets or some other bomb to get back? Well, Hamlet Glutton and Gruff Triplets are very different things. But basically now, both of those are going to involve like waiting a long time to like maybe use your horseman. And in Hamlet Glutton's case, 
you're going to be able to just like play other comparable cards and just like cast another card instead. And in Gruff Triplets case, like once you've cast the Gruff Triplets, like you're so likely to win regardless of getting it back that like playing a card that's like bad in your deck unless it's doing this thing is really unlikely to come up. Can you talk about your decision on number of lands and you have Brave and Sprawls? In general, I think Brave should decrease your land count more than Sprawl uh, because Brave, like, you still have to spend a land drop to get land into play, whereas Sprawl is at its best when it's putting you ahead on number of mana sources in play for the turn that you're on. Um, so, like, Sprawl wants you to have more mana than you otherwise would and cast bigger spells. So Sprawl wants you to, like, increase the curve of your deck rather than decreasing the number of lands where when you're already playing enough lands that you're planning to make your land drops, if you also play Brave, then you can't use the card that it's drawing you because you you just have more lands in your hand than you can put into play. So I'm much more likely to like decrease the number of lands I would otherwise play because I have Brave than because I have Sprawl. I think with these decks, um, you often want more than 17 mana sources. So a lot of the time I'll play like 17 lands and a brave, but whether and when I'll cut lands for braves is kind of a function of like how many other mana sources my deck has and how many other cantrips my deck has. But uh, I would say beyond the first brave, I'm almost certainly going to be playing uh, one less than 16 land per additional brave. Yeah, all right. I think we're going to wrap it up there. So... Thank you, chat, for uh, questions. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. I will be at KubeCon this weekend. Uh, if anyone hears this in time and will be at KubeCon, be sure to come say hi. Also, if you're listening to this podcast and you just like listening to me talk about stuff, you should probably know that I was a guest on the Humans of Magic podcast earlier. That came out um, a few days ago. And it is not about limited, but it is about me talking about stuff, mostly myself. So if you're interested in more background on uh, the person behind this podcast, then be sure to uh, search for Humans of Magic interview with Sam Black. And that's that's my news for now. So uh, have a good week and I'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. Prepare for light speed.